12 years ago today, I went to jail. And that that night before was pretty much what led me to get my federal time. So how the police actually got me, I had been hiding for charges when I actually was a drug dealer. But what I did was I let this couple that was selling drugs stay in my apartment. Now, in exchange for staying in my apartment, I got drugs. I didn't have to scheme, scam, steal, tell lies to my family. Didn't have to do anything like that. I just gave them a room. I got some drugs every day. And, uh, yeah, and to be honest, out of the drugs that I was getting, half the time when I'd go uh, to get the drugs from them, they'd be nodding out, and I'd have, you know, trade they were going to knock off a chunk of it on, and they'd have a razor nodding out, and I'd tap the razor, and I was, I was doing more drugs than they were of their own drugs, because every time they nodded out, I was taking more. <laughs> I mean, that's just what it was, for real. So... There's a guy in my apartment that night who overdoses. He's alive today, or he was alive. I don't, I don't know about today. I've actually searched his Facebook. He actually got brain cancer after this. It's really sad going up and down his Facebook. But there's, you know, I've got the messages back and forth between him thanking me for saving his life. I did mouth to mouth and CPR on this dude. I'd never met him for two days before, but they were wanting to drag him out in the hallway or down and out in the street and call ambulance. I wouldn't let that happen. So the police came, the ambulance came, and you know, I told some lie to the cops about, I'm supposed to go to rehab in three days, please don't arrest me. And the cops like, it's cool, it's you know, you really need some help though, kid. And he wasn't going, he wasn't going to put me in jail, but they ran my name. I had warrants from when I, from when I was actually selling drugs. Like I said, I was selling drugs for a long time, then I got caught. They didn't take me to jail. This smug, vice officer looked at me he's like we're going to leave you out because we know you're going to keep on doing it and we're going to get charges racked up on you well i just went into straight up hiding i've been on the run have warrants on me for a minute um and like i said i didn't want scheme scam steal so i let a couple that sold drugs in my apartment and they sold drugs uh they got a place to live and they're supposed to go outside to do every drug deal that's another note for another story but anyway the one the guy out of the couple he ended up getting arrested well, the girl had this guy over. He overdosed. I did mouth to mouth CPR on him, and uh, and he lived. And you know, as he was uh, waking up, as he woke up, as I we were being taken. Well, the cop said he was gonna let me go, but the cop ran my name. I had warrants for when I was actually selling drugs, as I said. He was awake, fully, they narcan him or whatever. He was wide awake, and I found out later what he'd done, which I'll get into that in another story, because I actually. I had an interaction with him in jail after that and found out the whole story of what had happened that night leading to overdose. And I said, when I, I had my hands on my back, you know, um, handcuffed. And, um, and I looked at him, I said, you owe me. Because the dealer, he's talking about how they've been friends since they were little kids. And I said, your childhood friend over there? I said, they wanted to drag you out in the street. I said, I didn't mouth mouth the CPR on you. And he's like, what, whatever. And I, and the EMS guy says, you idiot. He says, we saved you. Your friend over here kept you alive till we got here, though. He says, wake the F up to him. And I said, yeah, she wanted to drag you out in the street. He looks at her. She's just hanging her head. He knew I saved his life. But anyway, they put me uh, in a cop car. I'm doing the equivalent. When you break it down, you know, see, heroin's bagged up in bags. Like, People think it's a tenth of a gram in one of these wax, but it's not. Anybody who's been a dealer knows it's not a tenth of a gram. There are 20 bags in a gram. And that's that's on the high end. Sometimes you make 30 bags out of a gram. Depends on how people are doing it. But anyway, um, I was doing a lot of raw, uncut dope before it went in the thing. And I was doing more than they were doing, like I was saying. So they put me in the car. They take me to, uh, well, I was in the city. So they took me to Roanoke City Jail. And they uh, tell me, they set like bail or whatever there. And then they sent me to Roanoke County because that's where my charges were. Now in Roanoke County, I kept acting like I was addicted to Xanax and like I was going to go into Xanax withdrawal. The reason I did that is if you're an opiate addict, the, 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 how, what the cops are taught is, well, that, that withdrawal won't kill you. You'll wish you were dead, but shoot, they deserve it. It'll teach them a lesson. But Xanax withdrawal... That can kill somebody. So I, I said, I'm, 
hadn't had my Xanax in 24 hours. I said, I'm going to go into a seizure soon. I freaked out. They sent me to the regional jail. I get to the regional jail. They put uh, they put me in. Well, first off, they took my picture, which went on an ID card, and I was playing this role so much. Everybody in the jail for the year, they they'd get me to show my picture to person after person. I look like this. There's actually uh, I, I need to get the mug. It's somewhere on the internet. It's an awful, pitiful picture, but I was really playing up this part because I knew I was about to be in the worst withdrawals that had ever been in my whole life. So they put me in a holding cell. I make myself throw up. I know it's gross. Stomach acids and stuff. There wasn't no food in there. I ain't eating in days. I was 135 pounds. And I lay a foot away from this uh, pile of vomit. And I know that the guards are going to come around eventually. They come around there so often. It felt like for 30 minutes, probably was 30 minutes, that I just laid there and I shook. I don't know what I was fake. Well, all of a sudden, eight of them rush in. And I'm like, uh, y'all better give me something to help me calm down. Uh, uh. And I don't know what I was faking because a seizure, you, you aren't talking in a seizure. You're not coherent. You're not conscious. Well, I kept going, uh, uh, acting like I was going to throw up. And one of the cops had a handful of my head and he, that, that, that hurt for real. He pulled, yanked my head over the toilet and I gagged, nothing come out. But I just, I was playing this thing up like I was having some type of withdrawals or episode. That way that they would shoot me up with something. So then I wouldn't have to go through withdrawals. Now, this girl, this lady who came in, she was a man, she had a cast or some kind of boot on her leg. She kept trying to hit a vein in my arm and like, <sighs> just kept poking and poking me. And I made a job, I said, my God, I said, give me that needle, I'll hit it. And they giggled and they're like, yeah, I bet you would. And then I realized, oh shoot, I broke character. <laughs> and did that again. And uh, they eventually, Everything went black. And then I, I felt somebody smack me in my face. I said, Mr. Mumpire, help us help you. Stand up. And I remember like really jelly feet. I stood up. They said, okay, sit down. Next thing I knew, I was getting rolled away in a wheelchair. Now in the jail, they got what they call like a suicide room that's up front. It's like a glass room that they put crazy people in. They take away their clothes and everything, but I wasn't a suicide risk. They were just worried I was going to die, so they didn't make me get naked. They just left me in uh, in the jumpsuit, in the orange jumpsuit, with this IV hooked in my arm, with this IV stand here. They'd injected me with Halidol, and they kept putting bags of Halidol in there, you know, to calm me down. Well, it was like, there was like three, four days that just were gone. I slept every minute for four days straight. Um... And after that, I remember waking up and nibbling a little bit off food. I'm going through withdrawal still, so I can't, you know, eat much. And then, like, after day five or day six, I hadn't used the toilet in five or six days. I mean, I barely drank any water. I had to be dehydrated as anything because I, I just was out. Well, after five or six days of being in this glass room, you know, I wake up. I'm standing in there. Ain't nothing to do in there at all. Like, I watch all the p new people come in and stuff, and but I'm still half nodding because they got me in this IV at the Halidol. And I bypassed the worst part of my withdrawals. I tricked them. Yeah, I tricked them into beating the withdrawals so I didn't have to go through that. But I knock on the window because I can't find the toilet in this room. I knock on this glass window. Now, it's all glass. There's no walls. Like, okay, there's two, well, there's two walls, but then there's two more walls that are glass. And that's the room I'm in with this big, thick glass that's like probably unbreakable. I don't know. I didn't try to break it. I'm not, you know, some mental case, something like that. So, but they did have mental case in there. So I'm sure it was some type of special glass. But I knock on the door. I tell God, I say, hey, man. I say, I got to go to the bathroom. There ain't any toilet in here. He doesn't say nothing to me. Points at the middle of the floor. I'm like, what? What do you mean? It's like, over there. I walk to the middle of the room. There's a hole. On the ground, there's a hole in the ground. It's got, like, this mesh stuff, you know. Um, and I had to pee in that hole for the next two days. I didn't go number two for a week. Well, one night, I'm in this bubble room still. They done took the IV out of me, but they still got me in this room. They had not moved me to another room, which is, like, in solitary yet. So I knock on, I see this guy who's a guard in there. It looks like he's nodding out. I bang on the uh, the glass window. I go, hey! He jumps up. I'm like, come here. 
he comes over there. I say, look, man, I say, you see the jumpsuit? I'm not, I don't have a paper suit. I'm not, I'm not a suicide risk. I said, when I came in here, they thought I was going to die because I, you know, I was bad off on drugs. I said, I've, I've got to go number two. This is an issue. I can't go in that hole, man. Come on. And he looks at me and said, okay. I'm like, for real? He said, yeah. He unlocked it. There's a cell one room over. He let me go in the cell. Thank God I didn't have to squat over that hole. And it's glass. Everybody's watching anything you're doing. I mean, could you imagine squatting over a hole in the ground when people are watching do number two? So after that, they uh, moved me to another room, which was just in basically in solitary in the hole. And I stayed in there for a couple days. And then they uh, put me in the pod. But uh, I bypassed the withdrawals by faking that seizure thing. I mean, I spent like the worst part of it. Everybody knows anybody that's been off heroin. Like day three is like the worst. I mean, it was like day four or five before I even woke up like at all. And a couple of my friends that had been through intake that I talked to later uh, said that they'd seen me whenever they came in intake and that I was standing up. I wasn't laying down. Said I was standing up unconscious with my mouth open swaying. And they said that they were telling the guards, hey, make him see. He's going he's to hurt himself. He's going to fall down. But you know, you know, junkies got incredible balance. They'll, they'll nod out. They'll not, and their, their nose will go up. They'll be standing up. Their nose will be an inch away from the ground. Then whoop, they'll stay like weeble wobbles. They weeble and they wobble, but they don't fall down. That was me. But, um, yeah, um, the charges that I was put in there for were the charges I was on the run for, the distribution of heroin charges for when I was an actual drug dealer. Um, the charges, the extra charges I got came from just having drug dealers in my apartment, you know, in deals that I ultimately did not profit off of or arrange. I got an eight year federal prison sentence in which I did one year in jail, uh, five years in federal prison, got one year off for the RDAP drug program and one year off for good time. So I did six years on eight, but I did uh, five in prison and that one year in jail credit. But between the one year that I did in jail, I was at on bond for two years. Then I, then I self-reported to the prison. So that's how that happened. But this was the night. This is a weird day for me, man. Like I went back on that dude whose life I saved and I read his Facebook and I mean, you know, it about had me teared up a couple times because I read it because, you know, I did save his life. And I have messages of him talking about me saving his life. But he really went through a lot of uh, terrible addiction stuff. And it was just so sad reading it afterwards. And then he got brain cancer. Um, he went to California. And there are all kinds of people on his, uh, his Facebook wondering, is he alive? Is he dead? What I mean, he looked terrible. I mean, God, this was a dude that was like, He'd done like 10 years in prison and he was jack muscled up. And then I saw, saw him at most, most recent picture. He'd had like multiple surgeries, uh, you know, to remove tumors from his brain or whatever. He didn't even look like the same person. It was sad. It really, you know, just break your heart to see that. And especially some of the messages, because you know, a lot of the stuff, the talking stuff that's going on, stuff he's talking about, Nobody cares for him and family and stuff. It's just really sad addiction related stuff. But uh, more stories related to that. But that that was, this was the day that happened 12 years ago that, you know, started everything, kicked everything off. Um, I did beat the withdrawal. You know, drug addicts are creative. I found a way to slip one over on them, get by on them. I didn't want to have to go on withdrawal from a 20 to 30 bag worth of heroin a day habit. That would be awful. I had done it before. I know how awful it was. And I was in fear of that. But also from having going to rehabs before in other places, I know some rehab give methadone detox. I know jail wasn't going to give that. But I knew Xanax withdrawal, they took very seriously. And even people that were getting uh, tapered off Xanax in rehab, they still had seizures. So I knew that's something. That's something you can die from, the withdrawal from Xanax, benzodiazepines, and alcohol. They're actually interchangeable. So if you're in withdrawals from uh, alcohol, Xanax will keep you from having a seizure. If you're in withdrawal from Xanax and you drink a beer, it'll hit the same receptors. It's kind of a strange interchangeable thing. But anyway, like I said, that, that was the as the day that kicked it off. There's other stories, you know, about you know, 
certain people, certain stuff that happened, but that was what happened. Twelve. That was my day. That was what happened 12 years ago today. That's, that's, I was in that bubble room. <laughs> the IV in my arm with Howie dogs. I made them think I was going to fall out of a heart attack. I don't know what they thought. I mean, you don't talk to somebody and you're having a seizure. But it worked. Didn't have to go through what, you know, <laughs> what, uh, what I've gone through before and what many people will go through every day on from here on out. But I beat, I beat that that time. Anyway, that's it. Oh, my shoulder.